I'm Delta Work, and it's time for Very Delta. Coco fucking Peru is here. But first, do you want to see me go off? Because I think you want to see me go off. M. Oh. M. Mom! Are you a lady like me? Introspective, beautiful. Oh, are you intellectual like me? Beguiled by a bargain? You like wild times? Oh, like me? Are you serving the community like me? Well, if you are, then you must be very Delta. I'm Delta Work, and this is Very Delta a luxury public access podcast and YouTube talk show where I look gorgeous, speak extemporaneously, and invite fascinating people to sit on the couch and get Very Delta. Very Delta is for the woman who knows that steamy makeout sessions don't have to ruin your lipstick. But first, let's get into some things that are Very Delta. Let's talk about how to behave in a dressing room, specifically when you are an entertainer. From my perspective as a drag entertainer, I feel like there are rules that go across the board. I have been in every dressing space imaginable. I've been in beautiful dressing rooms with tons of lighting and a private bathroom and rolling racks and uh, cheese platters and and cookies and all of these different things, uh, uh, room for wigs. Uh, I've, I've been in those spaces. I also did a gig many years ago at a really, really cool venue. And it was in the middle of Colorado. And the dressing room was the ice room that was attached to an outside patio where it was raining. And in order to change in there, I had to close the door and it locked from the outside. So every time I wanted to get in and out of the dressing room, which there really wasn't a reason unless I was performing, I had to just use it as a holding area. I would have to knock on the door until somebody smoking would hear me knocking and then they could open the door. This is a real situation. So I've been in every kind of dressing room and I think there is a rule. I think there's a system of rules for all dressing rooms. First of all, no matter where you're going, you kind of need to know your place and how many entertainers are there. So you could show up to a place and they'll say, we've got five girls performing or five entertainers performing. Well, if there's five spots, you need to find out if you're the guest. As, as the guest performer, you need to find out which stations are already claimed and which one they would like for you to sit at. It is really not very cool behavior to show up to a dressing room and just kind of take over a spot, especially if you're a guest entertainer. I don't care if you're the headliner. I don't care if you're the person getting paid the most amount of money. If it is a shared space, you need to ask the person who brought you in, which is the space that you would like for me to get ready in? And you really need to mind your P's and Q's within that space. If you were to look in my suitcase, no matter where I go, I always have an extension cord, at least 20 foot extension cord, because these places may not provide you an outlet. Maybe you need a blow dryer. Maybe you need a makeup mirror. I don't know what it is specifically that you might need for electricity, but you have to bring your own extension cord. Even if you have it in a rider that says you're suppo they're supposed to provide it, you have to provide it for yourself because oftentimes these places will not acknowledge that they were supposed to do something like that. So, you know, you have two options. You either just don't use power or you just don't do the gig. But if you have your own extension cord, there you go. I would also say this is like one of my number one tricks that I don't think a lot of people do, but I have a handful of friends that do. And that is take yourself to Walmart, Target, Dollar Tree, any one of these places and buy yourself a door hook. And it basically is, you know, maybe around so big and it has a bracket that sits on the door so you can hang stuff on. Cause you might be in a dressing space where you're crammed into a corner and you're like, well, I don't really have anywhere to put stuff. You can always hang stuff off of that. You can hang wigs off of it. You can hang a garment bag. You can have tote bags. Maybe you're, this is a venue where you're getting tipped. You can open up a, a grocery bag, a reusable grocery bag, and your tips can go in there. 
A hook is amazing. I mean, I have two in my bag just in case. I uh, there's times where I won't use it for a month, and there's times that I will use it, you know, uh, for the entire month. Just depends on where I'm going to be. Um, that is super super important to have in your suitcase. I I, I also feel like when you go into a dressing space, you kind of have to realize that as a guest performer, which is usually who this is, this kind of storyline is going out to, is a guest performer in a space. Um, be aware of how much space you actually take up. You know, figuratively speaking, we like to say, like, don't be afraid to take up space. And that's very true. Don't be afraid to go places and make your voice heard or don't apologize for your size. Like, these are important things. But when it comes to a dressing room, you really do have to be mindful of the amount of space you're taking up. Uh, if there's only, you know, if there's five tables, you're going to have to contain yourself to the one table if there's five entertainers. Don't think that you can just put your wigs on another table or you can put uh, your shoes on that table. Like you need to contain everything. And then if somebody says, oh, we're not using that table, you're welcome to put your things on it. That's an entirely different situation, a different storyline. But to make this assumption going into a place that you can have as much room as you want without asking, it's really kind of piggish. And like, it's really not the behavior that you want other people to see from you. I mean, unless you have no problem with people knowing that you're a pig and ill-mannered, by all means, go for it. And that would probably be your last booking there. Uh, another thing that happens for me that I think is, um, I think it's questionable. And that is deciding when you need to blare music in a dressing room, because that's how you get ready. Some people don't want to hear whatever music it is that you're playing. So when you make this assumption that uh, I'm the first one here, so I set the tone for the music, like that's a little bit selfish. Right? I think we should default to no music. And then maybe somebody goes, hey, does anyone want to hear some music? And you say, sure. And then everyone goes, I don't know, what sounds good? Hmm, I don't know, maybe some 80s favorites. Or I don't know, why don't you put on your thumbprint radio on Pandora and we can hear some of the songs that you always thumb up. It could be that storyline, or maybe we agree to skip it. Um, I think when you go into a place, in addition to thinking about the space that you take up physically, you have to think of the space that you take up, uh, you know, with regards to sound, how loud you are. If you take a personal phone call and you've got it on speaker, uh, another behavior, not just that speaker, but another behavior that is super, super, super important to really pay attention to is social media. A lot of people are in a dressing room and they're like, Ooh, I look good. Let me get a picture of myself before I go on stage. And they want to take a picture because they're in good lighting and they get that. And then they post it and they don't realize the person behind them um, is pulling a piece of duct tape between their butt cheeks and they have no wig on. That is unacceptable. Like we cannot be posting pictures like that just because you looked good. You can't go, oh, they don't mind. Oh, it's funny. You need to crop that or you need to put a funny emoji over it or something because it's really disrespectful to assume that everyone in the dressing room doesn't care if you post pictures of them because people do. Sometimes people are in the dressing room and they're like, you know what? I need to go on Instagram live. I do it all the time. I'm the person who loves to go on Instagram live or TikTok live in my dressing rooms. But I always peek my head around in the dressing room and I say, hey, is everyone comfortable with me going live on Instagram right now? And there are times where people will go, oh, you know, what? can you give me five minutes because I'm going to change and I know I'm in direct view. Or there's sometimes people go, oh, yeah, no tea for a couple of reasons. Maybe they don't want people to see them without a wig on. Maybe they don't want people to see them before they do their number. Maybe they don't want their conversations broadcast like across the world. It's just, you know, it's a thing. If you're consciously doing this, you need to consciously consider other people in the dressing room. Am I being too loud? Am I broadcasting somebody's butt cheeks? Am I uh, uh, taking up space where things that could go under the table are now sitting on top of somebody else's table and now they don't have any room? Please, for the love of God, if you're a go-go dancer or you are somebody that's coming in for, maybe you're one of the entertainers that's coming in to do a tip spot or whatever the case may be, please do not come up to a, and please do not come up to an advertised paid entertainer station. Sit down and start using their makeup. 
That is so offensive, gross, and dismissive. Don't sit down and go, ooh, which perfume is this? Bitch, I need some of this. Don't do that. Keep your fucking hands to yourself. If you need to borrow something, there's nothing wrong with asking. Absolutely no problem. Nobody has an obligation to give you anything, uh, even if they have it. But if you want to ask, I don't think there's a problem with that. I have no problem sharing. I love to let people use things if they uh, if they need it, because there might be a time when I might need something. But I don't like people absconding with or uh, running away with or telling somebody, oh, yeah, oh, I used uh, Delta's hairspray here. You could use it, too. And then everybody's passing it around. Nobody knows who it belongs to. The end of the night, I pack and my hairspray's gone. If you want to use it, just ask me. Use as much of it as you want and then return it. It's so, so, so simple. Honestly, if you're in a dressing room that has a private bathroom and you need to drop a deuce, please take that deuce to another bathroom in the venue. This is just like shitting on a tour bus. Wait until everybody stops. Like you can pee, you can do, uh, well, you can pee. <laughs> That's it. If this is an extreme emergency, we get it. But by and large, don't think like, oh, when I get to the dressing room, I'm going to drop a deuce so everybody chokes to death. Like, just have a little decorum about yourself. You know, everybody takes a crap. I get it. Everyone knows that. But if you're in a space that's that tight quarters and you know that there's another bathroom in the space, yeah, it's not as private, but, you know, that's your fault for fucking uh, eating cheese when you know you're lactose intolerant. That's not my problem. Take that shit, no pun intended, to another bathroom. You know, I don't consider myself a prude. I really, really don't. I'm all for everybody having a good time, doing uh, adult things with one another. I think that's great. But nobody is impressed when you come into a dressing room and you try to, like, give oral sex to someone. Like, if you're trying to suck off a go-go dancer or you brought somebody in from the bar and you're like, ooh, look at us, we're dangerous. No, you're immature. That's not dangerous. Like, if you want to floss, let everybody know. If you want to floss, let everybody know the next day that that person paid for a hotel room for you to go have a good time in. Like, not in the dressing room where everybody's stuff is all laid out. Like, that behavior, that behavior is definitely, like, 21 to 23-year-old behavior. It really, really is. I mean, everyone has probably done that kind of behavior or seen that kind of behavior and knows that, like, oh, come on. Like, that, that's really... I mean, my God, in a dressing room. And then I think a lot of the people that do it are like, did you see what I did? Did you see what I did? Can you believe I did that? Like, no, I cannot believe that you did that. I think it's really, really lascivious. I think it's really fucking low rent. I think it's really gross. I think if you want to hit it with somebody and you want to punch out to the car or you want to punch out to the hotel or whatever, but like doing that in the dressing room, it's a little bit degrading for yourself and for everyone around you. I think that is one of those behaviors that is just like, come on, isn't everybody grown? I mean, we are all grown. Another behavior that is really questionable in general is just bringing your strange friends that don't know anyone else in the room into the room to just sit there and play on their phone. When the space is limited and you bring a bunch of friends to come hang out, it's really disrespectful. The dressing room is a sanctuary. The dressing room is like the locker room for drag entertainers. People, again, are going to be booty butt naked. People have all the money they earned in a night just laid out. People have their cell phones with pertinent information. People have medication. People have valuable costumes, uh, valuable laptops, uh, all these different things, the keys to their car might be sitting there. And you bring these strangers into a dressing room who think like, oh, this is fun. When something goes missing, the people that we're looking at are the people that you brought in here that never introduced themselves to anyone. Those are the people. And those people, by default, have made you the one who's responsible because you brought your fucking lousy friends in here. Don't bring your friends in here, especially when no one knows them. Now, if you're somebody who works in the show... And you're coming in to say hi, even though you're not there that night. That's different because you know the dolls. And because you're that girl, you're usually that girl that'll go, all right, I'm going to step out. I just wanted to come in and say hi. That's different. That's entirely different. But bringing strangers into a dressing room, whether or not they work somewhere else or, or you know them from X, Y, and Z, nah, 
we're not doing that. You're not bringing all these strangers in here. Not when my money's out. Not when my uh, I'm I'm trying to uh, put my tights on. Not when somebody over here is uh, not feeling well. None of that. This is a sanctuary for those who are working. The best food I've ever had in a dressing room was in Spokane, Washington, at a place called the Globe Kitchen like the Globe Bar, the Globe Bar and Kitchen. It was at the Globe in Spokane. My friend Jeremiah Keevy brought me out there and they pulled out all the stops. The venue is gorgeous. They uh, videotaped the show like on shoulder cameras, high def. The dressing room is down in the basement and the food was just spread out. We're talking sweets and cake pops and uh, savories. We're, I mean, it was all laid out. The restaurant, the the restaurant, the globe. It's the globe itself already has all these things available for their guests, but the food that they put out uh, for the entertainers was absolutely beautiful. Jeremiah Kivi at the Globe in Spokane really pulled out all the stops. I mean, it felt luxurious. I mean, you know. As the show's like, as you're getting ready for the show and you are like doing your makeup and as the show's happening, you're not really eating it. But when it's over, you're like, okay, I'm ready to grub because, you know, you don't want stuff in your teeth and all of that. But it was available to us. Beautiful fruit. I mean, I just think it was gorgeous. You know, I love the idea of a cake pop, but I feel like once you buy into a cake pop, it's like somebody already chewed a piece of cake and then just molded it onto a stick and then dipped it in fondant. Like, that's what I feel like it is. I know a lot more work goes into it, and I know no, no one has chewed it. I personally prefer to have my cake in a, a slice. If, if not a slice, a wedge. And if not a wedge, a, a pan full of cake. I want a lot of cake. I like cake more than I like pie. I love cake. I'm also like a person who, when I see something like a cake that has beautiful roses on it, and people are like, oh, it's too beautiful to eat. I don't think so. I think it is just beautiful enough to eat. And I, if you're cutting me a piece of cake at your party, you will want to make sure that I get a rose. Because I want, I want as much, I want a corner, and I want that corner to have the rose on it. I don't want that middle piece. Don't play with me. I want frosting. And as much as I love buttercream frosting, I'll eat whipped cream frosting. I'm cool with it. Like, I'm down with cake. You see what I'm saying? There's a lot of food that people decorate to make it look beautiful because, you know, your eyes are just as hungry as your stomach is. And so people think, oh, this is going to be so beautiful. It's going to taste so beautiful. That's not always the case. Sometimes people spend so much time decorating something that the insides are not great. You know what I mean? The other day I made a Dolly Parton banana cake and I was in such a hurry and I got so frustrated because the fucking things kept coming out of the, the mixer. I forgot to put the milk in the cake. So we baked it and it came up just fine and frosted it. It was just fine. And I was eating it and it was like, Like, I thought I was going to choke to death. But I was eating through it because the the flavor of the banana was so good, right? But there was something wrong with the consistency. It tasted like, it tasted like really cheap um, corn, corn muffins or like a cornbread muffin. It tasted like the awful cornbread that you get at Boston Market. Like, Boston Market by and large, needed to be read for like a long time ago. Boston Market, a long time ago, needed to be read for their wretched cornbread. Like their recipe is so wrong. Well, that was what this cake tasted like the other day. And it was beautiful. And it was, and, and the frosting was nice. So I was trying to get through it, but it wasn't that beautiful. I was like, forget it. Forget it. I forgot the milk. It was my fault. Do you want to see me take a break? Because I think you want to see me take a break. Coming up, Coco Peru gets very Delta. That's the tea. Today's guest is the queen of the one woman show who changed our lives with her iconic club bathroom monologue in the 1999 gay comedy trick. She's bitter, bothered and beyond. Please welcome the gorgeous, the stunning, the legendary Coco Peru. Thank you. This is this is this the is legendary. Was, Did yeah. you hear that? Well, and you know why? Because everybody Every one of these kids always says, oh, so-and-so is legendary. Oh, this is legendary. Oh, my gosh, this is legendary. I know. It does and get I'm thrown like, around a lot. And I'm like, really? 
Because, you know, we are standing on a lot of shoulders out here. We are all standing on a lot of shoulders. As am I. See, yeah. I, I, I think Charles Bush is legendary. Yeah. Charles Pierce, those were my heroes. Yeah. Waylon sure. Flowers with Madame the Puppet. Yes, yes. Of course, your fans have no idea who I'm talking about probably, right? But I think a lot do. And I think, oh, good. I think what I love about being able to have a, a, a podcast or, or a talk show or however people are consuming it is that they get to hear these these conversations and these voices and go, well, who is that? And then they go Google. They go Google it, yes. yeah. I'm thinking already about uh, Trick because for many people, it was their first exposure to seeing a drag queen, but not just a drag queen, uh, uh, somebody who would have the confidence to you know, pontificate, to say something of value <laughs> in that format. I mean, that that's so legendary to people. That's legendary, right? I mean, that's how I see it. I, well, thank you. And I had a great time doing that. It was a total accident how I made it into that film. Oh, wow, really? And yeah, and so I, um, it, it was just, and I was able to, the writer gave me permission to rewrite his original piece mm -hmm. so I added all that stuff in, like it's big it's beautiful wow. and you're gonna love it it's something somebody actually said to me one night no wow. some guy that followed me home Ooh. and uh yeah back when I was young and beautiful and didn't even know it oh like he followed you home and it was a good thing it wasn't like something frightening right oh I wasn't frightened at all <laughs> I had, it was New York City and I had so much confidence back mm -hmm. then that um no I was never spooked by um that kind of stuff I was Oh, I loved I loved the attention. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, it never felt dangerous to me. It may have been, but it never felt dangerous. And he was young and beautiful. Nothing happened, unfortunately. And if if I could go back in time, I would have dragged him up to my apartment. That's how you met people. Was like being at a bar and going. You called your friend the next day, and you're like, "Remember the cowboy that was at the bar? <laughs> I went home with him. Exactly. Right? Or I have. Do you know what?" BDSM is? I don't know, girl, but this guy's very into this and I'm going to find out more. That was how we connected. Yes. I loved cruising yes. back in the day. And there was a timing to it. Mm -hmm. You know, there was like, there were beats to it when you turned back. And and so every, I remember when I hit a certain age and I, I, I started to test it and it was like, I realized cruising, it's disappearing. Yeah. Like the beats were just not there anymore. Mm-hmm. But it's so you know, weird. It, it is weird, but things change and grow, and I had fun. You did have fun. I mean, I mean, I think we still have fun. You are the, in my mind, the the blueprint for what the concept of the one woman show. Like I've all in my coming up in drag, I've always known you as the person who always does one woman shows. Like that's what you do. Like. When you hear of like when people say P-Town or they say I'm on tour or this person is doing six dates. Like I always think of yourself. I think of Varla. I think of Bunny. I think of right. people that I know as the legends who were like, um, I, I've never felt those people like looked down on people who do weekly drag shows. But they're people that like yourself who have a lot to say. And so you just format it. What is the magic to that? How does somebody know that they can do that? I went to school in college for theater. Mm -hmm. And while I was in school, they used to do these cabaret shows. And Jonathan Larson, who wrote Rant, was the musical director. Oh, okay. And they were always politically driven, mm -hmm. but comedy. Mm -hmm. And that just appealed to me. And so when I graduated, I... And we also had to write a one-person show in college, and that also appealed to me. So it was all coming together. And then drag drag came into it because um, I wanted to be an activist, an AIDS activist. And I went to my first um, ACT UP meeting. I had the T-shirt, and um, I was so overwhelmed by the rage in that room. I was very young. right? And these people were... There was a lot of infighting at that point, mm -hmm. even within ACT UP. But to be in a room full of people that desperate, uh, and I already have so much rage, that I learned to suppress it in order to survive. Or I learned how to channel it in ways that were appropriate. Mm -hmm. And stepping into that room was so overwhelming to my young self. 
right. that I couldn't handle it. And I left that accent meeting going, I know I'm never going back there. And mm. I was devastated with myself, very disappointed. But I thought, how can I change the world? Right. I know that sounds pretentious, but that's the way I thought back then. And I thought, storytelling. Storytelling has the potential to change how people feel or what they might perceive you to be. Right. And so I started writing, and then I just I added the drag into it, and I just decided that I was going to embrace everything growing up in the Bronx that I had been told was wrong with me. Mm -hmm. Even through college, being told to butch up by my, my teachers wow. was so shaming. And so I thought, and the fact that I had a Bronx accent was another shame, shameful thing in the worlds of theater. And so I just thought, I'm going to embrace it all. Nice. And when I made that decision, it was as if the gods or whatever you know, mm -hmm. our, our ancestors, whatever, what, you know, I felt this feminine energy pushing me, wow. saying, you've made the right choice. Wow. And that was a very powerful. So I had lots of fears back then, but my goal was so much bigger than my fears for the first time in my life. Wow. And I just knew it was all going to work out. I and just knew here. it. Yeah, and like here now, it. here I am with you. How many, how many, uh, like say shows do you think that you've written, and and also too maybe written and not performed, or or do they change? How they that change, and I've I've written quite a few shows, but um, and they're all autobiographical, and I try to keep them current and up to date, and mm -hmm. they're always have that little political through line through it, and and the best thing is is that um, having done it for thirty one years. I've gotten all these years of responses from people that um, I did change some people's lives. Yeah. And that's like the greatest thing ever. Yeah. Mission accomplished. Yeah. <laughs> How do you, I mean, what, what what's the formula? Like, say I wanted to write something. Uh, I wanted to write a show. Like, what do you tap into first? Like, what you're mad about? Or... Yeah, I usually start with what I'm angry about in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, because I always feel like even in our daily lives, we have to address the ugly parts of ourselves before we can, um, so that we can feel light again. And so my shows always kind of follow that. Like I start with all the stuff I'm just angry about. And then by the end of the show, it comes full circle where I've sort of dealt with that mm -hmm. and can find some light again in my life. Wow. Yeah. And so um, the show that you just did, Bitter, Bothered, and Beyond, yes. which is sort of obviously inspired by the words of Bed, Bath, and Beyond. Yes. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. I um it was just out of the pandemic, uh -huh. you know, and just really horrified with everything that's happening in the world, N not just the pandemic, but um so much of what's going on. And um it's basically the 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 gist of the show if there had to be a if there is a through line and the through line is that um we we can all choose to look back in our lives mm -hmm. and find those very painful moments. But what we mustn't uh, let those moments do is stop us from looking ahead and going, mm -hmm. pushing beyond mm -hmm. that stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, well, that's what the show's about. Do you pushing shop beyond. at Bed Bath and Beyond? I used to. Yeah, yeah. They're not. They're not around much anymore. No. I do love going out and finding bargains, and you know that that twenty years ago, I used to also go to um, linens and things. Do you uh -huh. remember that store? I do. And I had a twenty percent coupon for linens and things, and I walked in there, the one in my neighborhood, oh. and they said this coupon expired yesterday. Oh. And I said, well, Bed Bath and Beyond accepts coupons that expired three years ago, and they said we can't accept this coupon, and I said. Oh. I'm. I. I looked at the woman. I said, "Your store is going to close for that reason." Yeah. And 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 when I drove by and saw that you know, liquidation sale, I felt so right. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I love that. I love. I do love being right. You know what? I would. I did want to say to you very quickly. You said something um, in one of your, one of your other shows about people who say no problem, no problem, uh -huh. and that resonated with me so much. Yeah. I, it just made me laugh. I love how you pick up on those. The these you sort of I. I always find like you're 
you're like me in many ways about like the things that bother you. The weirdest things. And how you things... can like, you can actually like flesh them out and make them a moment. Oh, I and, love that. And so I, I, that really resonated with me because I remember when people started saying, no worries, no uh -huh. worries. And at first I was like, that's weird. Who says no worries? And then, um, and then after a while, I was the person that was like looking at these people going, I wasn't worried. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really not. I had to start saying it to people. I'm not worried. Like waiters, you know, can I, like you said, can I get a, a lemon wedge with my iced tea? No worries. And I would, I would be the one to be like, I wasn't worried. Yeah. Anyway. And then for some reason. Did, that did resonate with me. I love on that. A, on a very deep I'm level. glad I'm not crazy then. No, you're not. Because sometimes uh, I always think, uh, you know, people use the phrase, um, oh, that person came for me. Yeah, but you sent for me, I think. I think you <laughs> sent for me because, you know, I don't think it's a big deal. If I think a lot of people get bothered when they'll say something that is maybe bothersome to you and then you repeat back to them. Did you just say X, Y, and Z? I don't know why you're coming for me. I'm repeating to you what you just said to me. So you're, you do have a problem with it then. You do know that that's questionable. I don't think people come for me that often, though. No? So, no. Now that I'm older. Do you uh do you like almond roca? I do. That's a is that a Spanish product? It is uh well let's see. It says product of USA. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it's gluten free. I don't know if you want one now or you want one no, later. No, I will not eat on camera. But I tell you what I do they have look for chewy. you. I have a dollar coupon. Oh, now we're talking. Keep that over there. I I love a coupon. Yeah, like you can take. Right you can off. have the whole thing there if you want. When um, you buy any two canisters. Oh, two. So it's a fifty cent. Really, is what it that's is. That's not. That's not really on sale. You know, when something's ten percent off, that's not really on. That's sale. That's not on sale. I don't think. I so. need them to dig deeper. I do too. Yeah. I uh, got a coupon in the mail from a, a catalog company I ordered from, and they sent me uh, a, an email, and it said, "Your items delayed." And we want to offer you this coupon code um, for your inconvenience. And it was for 50 cents off. And I had 30 days to use it. Well, this is like a $100 order of, I don't know, like the, what do you call it? F fast fashion dresses or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And I thought, 50 cents? <laughs> What the hell am I going to do with 50 cents? I mean, they weren't expensive dresses, but at the same time. But still, 50 cents is 50 insulting. Cents? Yeah, just don't say anything. Just say your it's order's like, delayed. It's like when I get a check from like a residual check. Oh, my God. You know, for the three cents, 27 <laughs> cents. It's just. You don't even want to deposit no, them. No, it's exhausting. Yeah. Where does your flip hairstyle come from? Is it something you've always loved? Well, I used to have big hair when I started as Coco. Uh -huh. It was very Anne Margaret. I love. And I was young and pretty, and people always said, you look like Anne Margaret. And then, you know, I was like, anyway, the guy who did my hair did it for free. He was a friend. Nice. And I would bring my wig up to him all the time in Westchester, and I never paid him. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't making... Sometimes there were nights where I would make such little money, I would have to go to my checking account, pray money would come out so I could pay my piano player. Oh, I understand. You, you know, okay. And he did it for free, and then I would I would get out of the car, and he would see me walking towards his shop with the wig, and I would see him roll his eyes. <laughs> oh my god! Didn't stop me from going in with the wig, right? But it did get to a point where it's like, and I have no talent when it comes to makeup or hair. I mean, you. I I don't believe that because that I've it seen is your wig true. on rollers it before. It is true. Oh well, I mean, that's why I chose something so simple. Mm -hmm. But when I first put the flip on, I had that moment of, oh my god, this is Coco. This is this is it. Uh -huh. The other thing is, and I've talked about this before, but I've always been drawn from when I was a child to silhouettes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I was more interested in the shadow than what I was watching. Okay. You know, the shadow that was being created. And also, uh, you know, Barbara Streisand was always made fun of for her nose. Mm -hmm. And then she would come out with this album with just that silhouette. Mm -hmm. I found that so empowering. Or Liza Minnelli, you always knew it was her, even when it was a silhouette. Right. And so I wanted to be recognized for my silhouette. I love that. And, and you are. I mean, everyone and, knows. Yes. And so I do believe that um, when people see a flip now, I have people send me pictures of that shape that they see in a noodle, 
in a Oh, that's so cool. Ox, you know, everywhere. Shower hooks. And so I have a whole collection of photos that people have sent me mm-hmm. of that 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 shape. That yeah. they see cocoa and everything. Well, I don't think people realize that getting such a severe flip to be so consistent is something that has to be managed all the time. <laughs> because you can curl a wig. And then you can sort of get it to flip up, but you kind of have to like, you have to tease it and then press it and do all that in order to get it. And, but the way you have it, 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 it there's movement to it. Mm-hmm. And I know that you have to set that and be diligent about it being on rollers and then be taken down when you're ready to wear it. Yes. People yes, don't know that. Yes. I, I have my little system. Yeah. It takes a lot of work. It really does. Drag is not easy as you know, and uh, I find it exhausting at this age. Yeah. You know, to put it all on and and then having to come back to your hotel and take it all off is not fun. Do you um do you have like a like a way of getting ready like do you like to be say in the bathroom or a place where you sit? No, Some I like ball. to sit at a desk like this. Uh-huh. I have my little mirror cuz I can't see anymore. Oh, and I, I tried I I tried the contact lenses and that was a disaster. I mm-hmm. screamed at the woman that put them in and I was and then she she said, would you like to try taking them out? I said, get them out. We well, I was just about to curse. Can we curse on this show? You can say whatever you want. Oh, okay. Well, I won't curse now because I've lost the moment. But <laughs> I did do a, a show recently where I said shitload and they had to stop recording because that's a, shitload is a bad curse word according to Oh, Fox, you were on Fox News probably. <laughs> yeah, me yeah, and Fox News. Were. Yeah, sure. Let's take a break. Zeri Delta is a proud sponsor of Almond Row Car, the original butter crunch toffee. Savor the sophistication. And we are back with the legendary. I'm going to keep saying legendary because I feel like I'm in the position where that that word applies. It 100% means um, it, it. It just it applies to you, and 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 I don't feel like it applies to that many people. Legendary isn't just somebody who's been doing something for a long time, or somebody that uh, you know. We talked we talked about your silhouette, and that is legendary too. But you're legendary because you are not afraid to speak up about what needs to be spoken about you know as i said earlier i was i coca was born out of this need to be an activist right. and when you're young and in your 20s and your friends are dying and you're seeing people just right really gets really sick it does it can't it affects you especially when you're living in new york city at like the epicenter of it all right and so uh Activism has always been a part of who I am and, and saying, you know, I, I can't separate it at, right. from Coco. And there are people who will have the nerve to say to me in my posts, stay out of politics. Oh, I mean, God. queer people, you know, people in it. our own community who will say those things to me. And I just think, oh, my God, you've got it backwards. I mean, yeah. change doesn't happen. And and. You know, I remember a different time, and we are, and things have gotten so much better. Although lately, they feel like that we we're taking many steps back, and the young sure. people are going to have to get out in the streets. I mean, I remember when gay marriage was first being talked about, and marching in the streets for that, and walking past the gay bars and looking in at the gay kids, looking out at us, going, "What? What are those people marching?" and screaming at them out of the bars into the streets. And I feel like we're at another moment here in this country, where we do have to start getting back in the streets. Although my feet now are just (laughs) maybe not up for it. But you younger people have got to get, you know, definitely vote. But there's so many other things that you can be doing. Yeah. So uh, activism has always been a a part of that for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so saying, saying how you feel. And certainly drag. Right. Allows you to say a lot more than I ever would say as just myself. Right. I'm actually very shy as myself and a bit mm-hmm. timid. And and that's what Coco Peru gave me my voice back. Mm-hmm. You know, I had I had listened to the bullies all those years. That's what I was to tell young kids. Don't waste your life listening to all of that nonsense because um that that in my new show I say your silence equals repression and that's how they win. They want you to be repressed because that keeps you silent. And um, so I learned early on that silence equals death, 
and literally. Yeah, liter- literally. Literally. It's um it's it's so scary uh t- to see uh when Raja and I um lightly will refer I don't know how it came up in conversation but somebody was like uh it was like a label thing, like top to bottom, this, that. And we said, we're elder femmes to, these, to, to the people that were like 20 years younger than us. You know, and because we were like, well, they're 20 years younger. That means they're old enough to be our children. So we are elder femmes to them. But there's other people that are elder femmes to us. And then maybe one day they will be. So there's this thing where we look to uh, elders that doesn't, in my mind, mean old, just older than me or a generation around that have no problem speaking up regardless of these other voices that are saying, don't get into politics. Like, which of course is so demeaning because it's saying, I know that you are just a clown. Like that's what that says. It's like you're purely yeah, for stick entertainment. Stick to entertainment. They they actually yeah, say that. They to say me. those stick words. Stick to entertainment. During Black Lives uh, Matter, when I was speaking up about that, oh, I couldn't believe some of the hatred thrown at me by fans. Yeah. Saying, you know, when you speak about this, it's upsetting. It's like, well, yeah, you yeah, should, you should be, be upset. You should be so upset. <laughs> you should be really upset. And there's really only a hand fee- handful of people that do drag that that aren't afraid of it. They're, they're not afraid to speak up or, 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 or say something or just use the platform in a way. And, and, and by you doing that, it just really sets apart um, – the difference between legendary and famous, oh, like I think, thank I you. think that adds to it. There's people that are wonderfully famous and beautiful and 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 and, and do all that, and people are like, "Oh, I love that drag queen." You you do that's good, but what are the how are they concerned about you yeah. or are they not? You know, this is this is a little corny, but um, whenever I get caught up in the fame thing or in the Hollywood stuff of comparing myself to other people or feeling like, I, uh, you know, I didn't get that role or I, I sh- you know, just I, I'm human and people, you can get caught up mm-hmm. in it when you're surrounded by it. It is my husband who will always say to me, why did you create Coco Peru? And I go, oh, that's right. Because I wanted to make the world a safer place for uh, LGBTQ people. Mm. And as soon as I get back to that core value that I have within myself, it puts it all in perspective. And right. all that stuff of comparing myself to other people goes away. And so I always encourage young people to get very clear about what it is they want mm-hmm. to really do in their lives. And I right. always say fame should never be the thing you go after, because if you don't achieve it, number one, you'll be disappointed. And number two, I know plenty of famous people that the fame is great, but it isn't what um, really adds value to their life. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. What, uh, aside from politics or um, what, what just makes you angry? What just, what, what, what are behaviors that people do that right now, if it was today, there's something that just pisses you off. Uh, well, my number one thing is litter. Yeah. You know that. Yes, I do. I hate litter. In fact, I posted something today. There's that wonderful, uh, those machines that they, I forget what they're called, interceptors that they okay. they place where the garbage that comes out of L.A. rivers or any any part of the country or around the world, you just can't imagine the plastic that comes out mm-hmm. because human beings are pigs and Mm -hmm. it drives me crazy but some brilliant young person invented these machines that capture all of that yeah and you know but i always make sure to post it if if i see it um because it just shows you that one little piece of wrapper or whatever you threw down on the ground that then gets washed by the rain into the drain that ends up in the la river or whatever river that ends up in the ocean you're just one little piece of that massive yeah. sea of plastic. And I, I just wish people um, could treat the earth as a, as the living thing that it is. Isn't it interesting how no there's... One, no wonder it was so ill. Yeah, yeah, you know, no, truly. It's a truly. reflection of the, the mental illness that we have, the way we just can treat not only Mother Earth, but each other. And it's interesting how many 
quote unquote people that are proud Americans constantly say like, oh, look at our beautiful country. Look at our beautiful. Yeah. Country. And then yeah, talk, sure. Yeah. yeah Yosemite. Toss it out. You, you're looking at Yos- a picture of Yosemite. Like, yeah. but what about you don't think the rest of the world, the rest of the country itself if, as an American yeah. deserves your American attention so that everything can be as beautiful. The oceans, all of it. Yes. Like. And, the, and this fear that like, well, no, none of this is my responsibility. It's too big. It's yeah. too big. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't even take that in consideration. They don't even use that argument. They just say like, it's not real. Yeah. None of this is real. And it is the reason why I had to start taking Lexapro a few years ago. Mm. Because I would have such a terrible reaction that my husband was often like, you're going to get shot because I would confront people. Right. Uh, and my my feelings were so overwhelming about this kind of stuff mm-hmm. because I f- feel everything too intensely, whether right. it's joy, whether it's all over the place. So my husband finally said, you need to be on pills because you're driving me crazy. <laughs> so I, I take five milligrams of Lexapro every day just to bring it down a notch. So I can still have the reaction, mm-hmm. but I can no longer let it um, destroy me. And it was. So anyway, there's my whatever. Oh, my I think, illness. listen, I think I'm <laughs> overdue for a doctor visit and five milligrams because my partner says the same thing. Yes. He's like, you know, you're overreacting about something that. And I'm like, no, I think you're underreacting. Well, that was it. I said to my doctor that we talked about my rage. Uh huh. And I said, well, I-, I have to tell you, I'm a little bit outraged that not everyone is as outraged so I as I am. But I do have to survive in a world that's not right, perfect. Right. Oops. So right, and I and I I get that. I mean, but I just I think maybe I need to go have a little visit because I do. I, I get, blow up about everything. Yeah, yeah. Five milligrams. Start with five, that. and edibles help too. I will say that as well. Is that marijuana? Yes. Okay. I discovered those during the. I mean, I've in the past, you know, dabbled, but never. But uh, during the pandemic, I um, I decided to try edibles as a a way to cope and um they're wonderful mother is a hippie junkie <laughs> yes no, she's she on is. drugs she's on At quaaludes 57 years old she's she... on all of it <laughs> yes and you know the other interesting thing and i don't know why i just thought of this but on the way over here i i, I was stopped at a red light and there was this beautiful dog here one black eye one blue eye and he's looking out and here i am in full drag and i if anytime i see a dog i have to like you know pay attention to them so like an idiot, I'm from the car, like waving at the dog and trying to get its attention. And she or he is looking at me and I just, you know, he, he was curious. And I thought, look at this dog that has no judgment. Mm-hmm. Or like the, the dog that was outside earlier. No judgment, just uh-huh. full of love. Yeah. And I thought dogs are incredible. And oh here we gosh. are in this country where... Drag bills and anti-trans bills. And I just thought, why can't we all just be more like dogs? And again, people who who <laughs> identify as proud Americans, always with a picture with a dog. And it's right. like all of these lessons are around you on how we can maintain everything beautiful. Everyone can get a, a piece of the pie. Yes. Everybody can get a fair shake. Everybody can be uh, equally uh, have their their medic, their medicine delivered to them. And you're still looking for a reason for that not to be possible. Exactly. And I think that's what you just said is is, is you're, you hit the nail on the head for me is that we're surrounded by signs and I see those signs yeah. all the time like that dog I'm constantly reminded of how we can treat each other and what the world can be and um, and I guess that's where my rage and bitter bothered comes from but then you know Delta we gotta get beyond it we do we yeah. do but you know and a five milligrams of like, so five milligrams of, and a can of almond roca after an edible. Right. Honey, I'm all for it. Well, so, you know, Raja's always telling me about the edibles and she's like, she tried to get her mom on them. And then, you know, generationally, some people are like, no, my mom. Yeah. I, I mean, I remember when I was a kid, my mom and my dad, they were they oh, they had a bong in the house. Oh, they really? Were, no, they not, were very hippie, yeah, hippie dippy. Yeah. And they. uh uh, but they were all, my mom was always like, yeah, that needs to be put away. He shouldn't be seeing that. And, oh. you know, it was always that storyline. So, um, but yeah, my mom, my mom's a hippie anyway. I agree. Right. And I just, um, I'd rather be around people that are a little bit high than people who are drunk. I yeah. can't stand drunks. 
Yeah. yeah. Especially at my show. Do they get messy? No, not usually. People who usually come to see my shows know what kind of show I do and that you really have to pay attention. Oh. But every once in a while, you know, someone has way too many. Do you get people that try to heckle or try to join the thing and you're like, this is not a conversation? Oh, yes. yes. How do you every deal now with and that? Then. I, I just, I, I shut them down. Now, if they're drunk, it's, it's a little harder. Right. And I will every now and then say, uh, one of us is leaving. I'll let the audience decide who should leave. Right. And then, of course, everybody turns on that person. Right. Um, and I hate having to do that. Right. It's not fun. Well, they put you but, in that uh, position. Yeah. Like you'd never invite yourself yeah. into that ever. One time I was in Boston and I and I sang Ring Them Bells. Mm -hmm. And in, in the cabaret worlds, when anybody would sing that, people would get up their keychains and you ring them bells and everybody would shake their keychains. Mm -hmm. So the audience, and some queen took his keychains, uh, a huge set of keys, I mean, and threw them at me and what? it whizzed past my face. Oh my God. And it really would have hurt had it hit me, but he yeah, was yeah. really drunk. And so um, I took those keys and I held on to them all night. Yeah. I wouldn't, you know, he was begging the, the managers to get the keys for me. And I was like, nope, he'll have to wait until I'm ready to give them back. Yeah. So, yeah, no, people are crazy. But for the most part, I have, I have great fans of all different ages. Uh, YouTube changed my life as far as attracting a younger mm -hmm. audience. And um, Were you on five milligrams when he threw that, or was that before that? I think I was already, no, that may have been before that. It may have been before. Well, I was yeah. thinking if it was before, you might have thrown them into the dumpster and had him fish them oh, out. I did have a moment where I thought, he's not getting the keys. Right, oh. right. That's I See, that's yeah. why I need the five. Yeah, because I did want to. I would not get them back. But, that number you know, my mom who's 96, by the way, uh, she did teach me very early on, never hold grudges mm. and never, um, never respond in the moment. I need to learn that one too. Yeah. So you have to like, uh, give it a moment. Don't respond because you're going to regret the blow. You know, why did you wait till I was this old to teach me this? <laughs> I should have you're known still this. young, sweetheart. I should know this. I can't, I get so Bugged. I'm I like, know, why is it so hard? I do love that about you. I mean, that's what why I I think that's I mean, there's many reasons I love you, but Aww. one of the reasons I always enjoy you so much is because um you make me feel less alone in my sort of oh, I love that. Thank madness. You. And see, and that's how I yeah. feel with you. Yeah. I mean, I there's things that like you obsessed when you I don't I don't want to say I, I say obsessed because I heard other I people do obsess. say it. But I heard other people say it and I didn't think it was an obsession. I thought it was information. And that was about the panettone. I feel yes. like some people were like, oh my gosh, look at she's obsessing. I'm like, what do you mean? She's informing. Like, this is a what first of all, this is a what I I believe a wonderful gift. And I think that they are I could eat it all year long. Oh, I really love Panatoni. And I just I was like, this is like, and people were a lot of people thought, oh, it's entertainment, and it is, but I was more informed. And I was like, this is vital information. This is information. <laughs> this isn't a funny. <laughs> well, you know what's funny is that suddenly panettones are everywhere. Everywhere. Little ones, big yes. ones. And people talk about the panettone this and the panettone festival and how to make a good panettone uh, mm -hmm. dessert. And I just think, you know, I think I had a little something to do with that. I believe it. I, I believe it. Do you like raisins? I love raisins. See, I love raisins. Have you? Ever I will a... eat raisins right out of that like sun-made thing. Mm -hmm. And then you get to a certain point of eating them where you realize... I've eaten way too many raisins, and I never want to look at another raisin ever again. I threw up on raisins once. I'll just put that out there. Yeah, and the thing is, and you know there's going to be a problem in a few hours because it, it, they can do its own <laughs> they thing. They can go right through you. It can do its own thing. But see, I even I, – I, I love prunes. Oh, I, yeah. love oh, I love prunes, a good prune. too. A prune Danish – Oh. It's so good. It's so good. Hi. I love coffee cakes and stuff like oh, that. That's my favorite. God, you know me what I mean? Too. Anything dry. Mm -hmm. I love that. I, I want love it, dry. I want it with coffee. I want it with tea. I yes, want to I like it. to dunk. My exactly. father used to drink. We used to get buttered rolls in the Bronx. You can't find them anywhere. Uh -huh. And you you would they they would butter them for you, and then you dunk that in coffee, oh, and then you so look good. at your coffee it has that slick of like uh -huh. oil on top. That's it's beautiful. Delicious. That is so good. Gosh, I so want to eat that. Have you ever had a, a candy bar that you can get at the liquor store called Chunky? 
Uh, the, a, the square. And it's got yeah, that's peanuts, from the 70s. It's got peanuts and it's raisins. Like, and it's in like four things, yeah. right? Yeah, that's from the 70s, it's darling. It's so good. My father used to send me up the street every day to buy him a pack of cigarettes. Uh -huh. Kent Golden Lights, I still remember. I remember 75 those. cents. He would give me a dollar, and with the extra quarter, I could buy a candy bar. I love that deal. Chunkies. Uh -huh. I often would get a chunky. Charleston Chew. I love Charleston Chew. Did you ever get you know a Chico Ch stick? I don't know what a Chico it's stick like is. A, it's like a peanut butter stick with coconut on the outside. Never heard of it. A look bar? Never heard of it. You never had a look bar. No. Okay, what about Well, these a, might be West Coast things. We had Fifth different Avenue. things. Fifth Avenue oh, I loved. God. Milky Way I loved, Three Musketeers. Wait, a Milky Way and a Three Musketeers? There's nothing in that but nougat. That's all. I was a chocoholic as a kid. You I like didn't it. care. I had so many cavities. You know what you might like? If you go to C's Candy, you would like a rum nougat. It's what it's Ooh, called. Yes. And it's got like a little tiny bit of cherry in it, but it's got nougat and it's got chocolate and it's got like walnuts in it. Oh, I, I'm allergic to walnuts. Oh, you, you can't eat it. right there. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're well, trying we'll to, to kill get me, I am. You can get a Rocky Road then. A Rocky Road. They have a Rocky the Road. The thing is, is that I'm not big on sweets. I'm more into salt. So if mm. chocolate has salt on it. Now, Bianca okay. just gave me some, Bianca Del Rio just uh. gave me some vegan cookies she made that was chocolate, Ooh. but she put salt on top. Delicious. Yeah, that brings that really wakes it up. That's I think delicious. when you do that, do you anyway. like uh, do you like popcorn? Yes, I love popcorn and I love kettle corn. Mm, kettle corn is good. This Target by my house used to have uh, one of the little old kind old timey like a snack bar, uh -huh. and they always had regular popcorn and kettle corn, and they would have yeah. a big bag like this yeah. for a dollar seventy five. Yeah. And you would get it while you shopped. <laughs> and it was only recently that they got rid of that whole area to do the um, the online shopping that they take yeah. out to the cars. Yeah. Which I they get, did that but... at my Target too, by the way, in 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 North Hollywood. Do you do do you do online uh, where you go drive up and they bring the stuff out to the car? No, no, I like yeah. to walk around. Me too. I like to walk around. Sometimes I'll actually tell my husband, you know what, don't come with me today because he likes to rush through. Mm -hmm. I like to meander. In fact, I love that word, meander. I love that word. So I'm, I like to meander. Don't rush me through a store. Yeah. Yeah. My partner knows that about me, too. My partner, Davey, he, uh, will, he will know that, like, if I'm not here doing something or I'm not at a show, he's like, you're getting restless. Yeah. You're getting restless. Yeah. And he'll always say, why don't you do a wig? Or why don't you, you know, yeah. why don't you make some jewelry or do something that makes you happy? And I'll say, he's like, you know what? You want to go to Ross. Yeah. Why don't you just go? Just go. And I'll go. And I'm like, yes. well, don't you want to go with me? No, I'm so No. No, you no. just go do it and you can yes. come. And it'll be like 9 o'clock at me, night. Give me racks to dig through. And, and I don't even heaven. need anything. No, no. I want to find no. a deal. It's all yeah. about the deal. Yeah. The only thing I can't do okay. is I can't shop like in the garment district where I ran into you that day. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now tell me if you can do this. How much is this a yard? Uh -huh. They tell you how much is a yard is. Do you try and... Say no. You can you bring it down a little bit, or do you just give them? The I because I go so much. Uh, I I don't. I won't. I won't ask anybody. I won't bargain with anybody. Oh, I can't bargain either. I won't I'm do a it. Terrible bargain. I won't do it. And I definitely, definitely, definitely would never bargain oh, with. Oh, they're giving us the red line. Uh huh. They do it. Yeah. Um. Like I definitely wouldn't bargain with somebody selling like their personal wares. You know, if somebody's yeah, like, oh, I yeah. made these necklaces, whatever the price is, that's the price. Yeah. I can't. I had a yard sale. I love yard sales. I had a yard sale. This woman shows up just as we're closing the yard sale down. I know we have to wrap it up, but I have no, two homemade on. lamps that have been left in the house from the people that we bought it from. And I wanted to sell them. It was the end of the day. And the woman says, how much for these lamps? I yell into my husband, how much do we want for these lamps? $10 each. Okay. So I said, $10. She says, for both of them. Oh, no, I said six six dollars each. And she said, uh, no, six dollars for both of them. And I held them. I said, I would rather take these lamps and smash them on the <laughs> cement. Absolutely. Than give them to you for six dollars each. And she turned around and she got in her, her uh, Mercedes Benz uh -huh. and drove off. Uh -huh. So, yeah, I don't, I don't like to do that to people because uh -huh. I don't like it being done to me. Yeah, I don't I'd rather do that. smash the lamps than give you the deal. Well, I mean, this is just like if somebody asks you to do some sort of gig or something and then you tell them what the price is and they ask you, can you do it for, you know, a third of that? And you're like... Or for free. Or, oh, I'm get out of here. Let's take a break. Oh, my God. 
Do you want to? Read me Delta. Stay tuned. Welcome back. This is the portion of the podcast talk show. I, I always feel pretentious saying like the talk show. Well, it, but is. it is. We're talking yes. and it's a show. It's a, it's a show and we're it's talking. We're talking. Right. Um, the bullshitting. Yes. Basically. Yeah. This is where we read letters. People send in yes. letters. Read me Delta. This is and if you have, if you want to write a letter in, send it to readmedelta at gmail.com. Any questions about stuff you've already seen on here, or maybe you need some advice that whoever is here would be happy to to answer. Um Let's see what we have. You're like my husband with the letter opener. I love it. He only opens things with the letter opener. I love it. I, you know, and he gets the... so mad at me because I tear things open. Really? He gets so mad at me. Well, sometimes I forget and then uh, I forget to bring it. So I have to use a makeup brush. Uh, and then sometimes I go too far in and it tears the letter. Oh, you just did it. I just did it. <laughs> uh, but it's only, that's, the, that's the yucky part anyway. Okay. Dear Delta and fabulous guests, why do people watch cop propaganda rape shows like SVU and CSI before bed? That can't be good for your head. I love watching your talk show and podcast when it premieres a day early on Mom Plus. Thanks, Shoba. Wow. Do you watch uh, any kind of shows like that? No, I don't. You don't like that? I Well, but I do watch true crime things. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because... Um, there was at one point where we were watching a little too much true crime. Mm -hmm. And my husband and I were sitting on the couch. And at the exact same moment, we looked at each other and go, are you creeped out? Like, are we watching too much true crime? Mm -hmm. And so uh, we had to back off of it for a little while. Really? Yeah. But I, I like, I love documentaries. Yeah, The best. Yeah. The best. Uh, documentaries for me, the be uh, I just love getting into people's lives. But... um. You know, those other shows that they mention, um, I'm sure they're good, but it's not my thing. Um, yeah. Unless I'm getting paid to be on them. Then it's then it's amazing. Then it's my thing. Yeah, then it's, it's my been thing. It's my thing forever. <laughs> Years ago, I, I, did, I did an episode of New York Undercover. Okay. And, oh, I could really tell you some funny stories about it. But the one thing was, I had finished filming. Okay. And they said, they called me and said, your character get, gets murdered. And we need to film you. You have to come in for a day. And you have to be in a body bag. Oh, my God. But it's only going to be like 30 seconds. And I said, do I get paid a whole, like, SAG day for mm -hmm. those 30 seconds? And they said, oh, absolutely. I said, I have no problem being in a body bag. You yeah. Know, I was broke back then. And so I think when if I if I remember correctly... When they zip me up, I have a smile on my face because I'm just thinking about I'm getting paid <laughs> good money, the money to lay here dead. That is so funny. Yeah. And the other moment that I'm really proud about about that New York Undercover was there was a scene uh -huh. where after I am look like Kokopuru and carrying on like Kokopuru, where my character was supposed to say I'm straight. Uh -huh. And I said, that's a different thing. I'm a drag queen. You might be talking about court. They were like, we did our research. I was like, you did your research, but it's not correct right and i'm not as a openly gay man and carrying on like gonna now say i'm straight if kids are, you know so i stopped production wow and refused to work until they re rewrote that line now it was filmed in new york so they had to wait for los angeles to wake up oh and for gosh. those writers to come in before they could change it is and that I really was, how all that works yes and oh. i was very proud because there were Drag people and trans people on set who came up to me and, and thanked me and said, girl, that was, yeah. that was, gr we can't believe you had the guts to do that. That's epic. Yeah. Yeah. Le that's legendary status. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I, you, at the time you were speaking up for yourself and what you thought, but. Yes. But I, 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 it's almost like I look back on those moments sometimes when I've been like that and I think, how did, where, who did I think I was? back then you know but you, you knew who you were that's yeah. the thing that's what's that's what's exciting when people see hear this they can realize like there are things to speak up for and and when we really have to um understand you know there's a big war and there's a lot of little battles and you really i mean we really do spend our lives trying to pick and choose these battles but some people it's like you're on the wrong thing yes you're on the wrong thing yes. it's so i address worse. a little bit of that in my, in really? my new show okay uh, about some of the yes exactly yeah. that 
There's so yeah. much of that. I um I I actually love these kinds of shows. Um I never I always wanted to be in like um do like TV show appearances in drag or where they're like, we need a drag queen for this. And I always wanted to do that, but I never really knew how to do that. So I just never did. One time I got to do something and it was with Willem. And uh, I don't know if you are familiar. He lives in Palm Springs. Kevin Wiley, who mm -hmm. uh, is a Dolly Parton and Reva McIntyre. Yes, I know, I know Kevin. You know Kevin. Mm -hmm. um, Kevin did it. Venus Delight. Uh, this was before Drag Race. And Chad Michaels. Mm -hmm. And it was a show called Women's Murder Club. And we did an episode of that. And and Chad was more the the main role along with Willem. Willem was the show host. Chad was supposed to be the star of the show. So they did mock-up pictures of like yeah. whatever her name, D D Dakota Michaels, yeah. or, you know, that kind of a thing. And um, me and Venus were, and Kevin were all teamed up with like male counterparts that were supposed to be our dates at the cabaret show. And um, somehow I knew like they were going to team me up with like, the older guy that looked like, uh, hey, I got the money. <laughs> like he had a paper, a, a clip like this. And so that was the guy I was with. And then the other two were with like young 20 something guys. Uh -huh. And I was like, whatever, I'm fine with it. I actually like that storyline. Um, but I remember Willem saying like at that time, cause she was, had already done a lot of stuff like yeah. that. And was saying like, you know, if, if there's water involved, that changes the price. And if this is involved and if you don't take your break and she was so well versed in that, but would share that information with people that didn't know. Yeah. And that's how you kind of learn. And in fact, I remember Chad, when you say the body bag, Chad's character had to have her face shoved in a toilet and she was murdered that way and they needed to shave her head. So she got paid extra to have all her hair shaved off. Wow. It's so interesting that you say that I'm pointing this knife at you like I'm mad or something. All these shows have to be bad for, I, I, I think I agree. They are bad, but you know, there's worse things going on. What Whatever. is that? Another Th letter? This is another letter in a Luar purse. Oh, Mark put it in there. So cute. Isn't that neat? Mark did that. Okay. Let's hope I don't rip anything here. Oh, let's hope you do. I'm I, I'm really uh, I have several letter openers. I like letter openers. I think they're fun. Oh. Okay, let's see. This looks like a short one, and that's that can be good. Um, hi Delta. What animal videos are you watching on your phone? I liked an emu named Emmanuel who misbehaves. Yes, well, love I know that very emu. Wook. You know that one? I know the emu. Tell me. I don't. Oh, he just uh, the the woman that has owns or works with these emus, so she's trying always to make a video, and the emo keeps getting into. The camera. Oh, I do know. You know yeah, yes, I do yeah, on yeah. TikTok. Yes, I see them. Yes, yes. I, I love animal videos. Same, all day long. Yeah, I'm constantly sending kitty cat videos to Hecklina. Oh my gosh! Like that's our thing. Mm -hmm. Besides the really awful stuff that we send. Those back two. And forth there's to a balance. Yeah. But cute cat videos. I love dog videos. Then I send the dog videos to like Bianca and some other friends uh -huh. that, you know, like dogs. Yeah. I happen to have grown up with both cats and dogs, so I don't really have a preference. Yeah. I grew up a little bit. We, we did have dogs for a while in San Diego, but pretty exclusively now for, I don't know, 30 years, I've always had cats. Mm -hmm. And I love, I love, 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 love my cats. We had three white identical cats. They were mm. brothers and sisters. And the first one was named Pete. The second one name was named Repeat. And the third one was named Stillmore. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. The Bronx. I love yeah. that. I love that. I also like these videos. Uh, it, there's an account on Tick, on Instagram, Nicolette Carlone, and she just is, I guess, a purveyor of beautiful things and also has uh, a storefront where you can order like vintage uh, um, replicas. Mm -hmm. And she always like posts for, during a day like beautiful cakes that are that look like pieces of art. But one thing she always posts are these videos of like little bunnies eating strawberries. Oh, yeah. In the wilderness or like little chickadees, like drinking water. I love videos like they're so gentle. I do, too. And it's so I weird because too. I will be awful and watch a full car crash and then I'll swipe up and I'm like, oh, my God, can you believe that? And then I swipe up and I'm like, look at the bunny. <laughs> I think this is conditioning us <laughs> in a way. Oh, for sure. For sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But I but going back to those videos, I love I saw one just the other day and it was three cats, maybe four cats looking up at a tree and they were all, maybe there was a bird or something and they laid over it this like, uh, a, a, like a Latin prayer. So it sounded like they were like summoning something. Yeah. 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 I love shit like that. Yeah. It's so funny. It's so hard. It's so, it, it just makes you feel so good. Animals are incredible. 
I had a cat. Um, no, I didn't have this cat, but a cat died in my front yard. Oh. And I was devastated. And w when I went, I went and got my husband. And then when we came back, there was another cat that sat by it for hours oh, until the no. city would come pick that up. Isn't that sweet? Yeah. He like just sat there so patiently mm. for his friend. It broke my heart. Yeah, anyway, absolutely. Five milligrams. That's all I have to say. Th and that's what I need. <laughs> I re I think I need 10 because I think that's based well, on weight. Most people. It, oh, that's true. I heard that yeah. recently. So I'm in like 30. A, a neighbor of mine was like on 40 or something like that. And I said, what do you need that much? He goes, because I'm a big boy. Oh, so he needed 40. So he needed a lot more than me. Oh God! What am I? How much is a hundred milligrams going to be? Because I think I really <laughs> no, uh, could be bite it in half and then half half much. later. Yeah, exactly. Maybe you, I don't no. know. I think it. I don't, is it causing you to edit yourself? You think? That no, no, that's good. No. I don't want you to edit yourself. No, ever. it didn't change me at all. Yeah. No. You just. No. It just like delays uh, the it, reaction it, a little bit. No, not so much the reaction. I just don't obsess, um, so much, and I also don't go to the dark place okay, of okay. Where, where that obsession spirals into just feeling dark about, um, you know, the world is ending and people don't care about other people and mm -hmm. those dark thoughts would, would take over. Right. And s which would then lead to um, sort of a depression or, sort, yeah. you know, um, I don't want to... I don't want to say a depression for people who really suffer depression, mm -hmm. but it was, it, I could go to a dark place. Right. And it could last for days. Right. You know. Um, so. I'm wearing the earrings that you gave me. I don't know if you see that, but they go with my necklace. I'm happy. Yeah, I had this. I did a little uh, clean cleaning up of my cocoa stuff, mm -hmm. and I got. All those dresses I bought at Ross and one, I've just, I've just literally, the, everything's now in, in my garage in bags. Uh huh. Probably going to donate half, most of it. Yeah. And um, I dug through some of my jewelry and I thought, I thought of you. I said, I'm going to give this to you. They're today. perfect. So I mean, I, just... and I have to tell you something that you had no idea about this. I was like, I really want to wear this necklace. And because I like this dress, although it's moving around weird, I think I'm wearing the wrong bra. But uh, I wanted to wear, I felt like it coordinated. And I said, I don't have. An earring that's like irreverent enough to go with this because this has no s exact storyline. Right. It's not f it overtly feminine. It's not really vintagey. It's kind of like an artsy sort of piece. And then when you were like, oh, I have these ear," I thought, oh, my gosh, I didn't know what I was going to do for an earring. I thought I could just fix my hair so no one saw it. But now that they're there, I'm like, I now I have to wear this all the time. That's great. I love it. I that's love it great. so much. That's the magic of drag. It is. And that's what the other thing I always tell young people is that don't overthink stuff so much. You mm -hmm. like the magic is in just doing it mm -hmm. and 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 trusting that it will. That's that was my process for creating Coco mm -hmm. was that um, I just threw myself into it and trusted that it was all going to work out. And so sometimes when you do that, those little magical moments happen. Right. Like, hey, I'm just going to throw on this necklace and. And then the earrings appeared, and I and I think what's beautiful about that is like it, it, it's uh, it's in a it's in a literal sense yes it worked but in a figurative sense if you take that with you and realize that uh, you know this can be applied as a philosophy all the way across the board yes and that's what people I think learn from drag mm -hmm. is that rather than living in what society says you should be, drag queens who are so courageous and have lived through lots of stuff to get to that point where they cross over into that realm of drag and that freedom mm -hmm. and that liberation. And we learned something very valuable that you can apply to everyday life, right. is that you chose to be Delta Mm -hmm. You chose to create Delta. And in creating Delta, you're living in that moment. Mm -hmm. And that's something we should do every day of our lives. Right. We get to create our experience here on Earth. It's not who you were, you know, how, who, the, the, the stories, you know, living inside that box mm -hmm. is so boring. It's when you step outside of the box where the magic starts to happen. Right. So even I tell, you know, that's why some of the housewives I can, you know, that are married and they 
they did what was expected of them often will say, I, I wish I had seen your show years ago. And they're happy right. and whatnot, but they realize that we have choices mm -hmm. every day that yeah. we get to make to create the, our lives. Yeah. This is, I mean, this is, this is mothering. This is mother mothering. <laughs> like this is really, and I, 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 I have so many uh, contemporaries from Drag Race that, that all always say like, the panel of Drag Race would benefit so greatly from people like Coco Peru and Jackie Beat and Varla Jean Merman and Sherry Vine and all Lady Bunny being on the panel judging and mentoring because they have been walking in these shoes for a very long time and have been working for free and paying piano players out of checking accounts and uh, have been there and done that and in this way can mentor and say, I see what you're doing because I was there before. Yeah, I know what you want because I can tell by the way that you're behaving. It's a way that I behaved before. And could offer that advice. And we all, we all always say like, why are the legends? Like we need the legends on the panel too, to come up and say, we, here's my advice. You yeah. want some advice? I know. Cause I actually do drag and I've been doing drag. I do one woman shows. I did bar. Yeah. You know what I mean? I do think there is value in, in, uh, hearing from people who, who have done it before. And unfortunately I, I didn't have that when I was young. Right. Um, I didn't have a mentor. Right. I did have Charles Bush that inspired me, and Charles was available to ask questions and whatnot. But um, I didn't have the guidance. I was, I learned it as I went along. What I would encourage people, young queens, to do is show up on time. Actually, show up fifteen minutes earlier yeah. than your call time. Keep a neat dressing room. Right. Yes. Treat everybody with respect, uh, even the tech people, because yeah. they're the ones that are going to make you look great. And it's just the right thing to do. Sure. And um, work on your craft. A hundred million percent. I mean, really, just being just it, it shouldn't be that hard just to be nice. You right. know, you don't have to kiss anyone's ass, but no. you definitely well, although sometimes it doesn't it doesn't hurt. No, it doesn't no. hurt, especially if they are the ones that are lighting you or yeah i'll kiss their ass yeah mind. yeah or if they're the person that's like we're not supposed to ask you if you want a starbucks run but we'll include you <laughs> well get over here let me kiss your ass i would love something i would love an iced beverage yes that sounds great thank you for being here oh it's my pleasure it's... you know we have been trying to do this for so long I know. and our schedules were always wacky and so i'm so happy that it finally happened thank and you. um I do appreciate you. Thank you. It makes me feel great. I mean, honestly, I, I, I you are the name that people constantly in comments or uh, in direct messages are like, when are you going to get Coco Peru? Have you even tried to get Coco Peru? Like she people, tried. People really, they, the, I mean, the world loves you as they should. But I mean, I think it's great when it's really young people that are like, I want to hear of a I voice. That yes, I love young people. Yeah. And I feel like people write to me saying, can I call you mom? And can I call you grandma and whatnot? And I go, yes. I feel comfortable now at 57 years of age. Right. And um, and I learn from young people. Yeah. You know, so if they can learn from me, that's great. But I'm interested in young people and what I can learn from them as well. 100%. Thank you all so much for listening to Very Delta. You can search for Very Delta on your podcast apps. We come out every Monday and we want you to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Also, a special hello to everyone watching the talk show on YouTube. We love you so much. Thank you so much for sharing the clips, commenting, uh, sending your questions in. All of that keeps the podcast going and it means the world to us. So keep doing that. Also, send your questions to readmedelta at gmail.com. Questions about this episode, previous episodes, or I don't know, maybe people's manners. We love questions like that, don't you? About judging people's manners? Judging people's manners. Oh, yes. I can't stand Advising being them. in public sometimes. I know. It's gross. I mean, I'm the worst person on an airplane nowadays. Are you? Well, no. I'm the, the best person. You want to sit next right. to me. But I'm the one that's... Um, one time that I had to... 
I know you're wrapping it up, but no? I had these two people behind me talking on a on an international flight. Uh-huh. They shut the lights off. You've already into, it's time to sleep. Yeah, yeah, it's time. You know what I mean? Yeah. And my husband could tell that I was getting worked up. He said, "Promise me you're not going to say anything." Oh and I said, "Okay, I promise I won't say anything to these two people behind us yakking away." And after about ten minutes, I took out my notebook and I wrote, "Shut up!" Oh my and I held it over my head. Of course, my husband was horrified. I said, "I didn't say it." But you got the message. But I across. got the message. Across. Yeah, you have to sometimes. Yeah. I'm that person. I can't I, see. This is the thing: is I I would never be mad at that because I think it's you would love me on an airplane. Oh, I well, I mean, I love you everywhere. But here's the question: um, when you are on the airplane, um, what's your beverage? I either have just plain water or a nice soda water. They they serve some like flavored yeah. soda waters. Those are good. Yeah, those are. I good. just I don't I like, like to, at my age. You don't want to get too gassy on an airplane. Uh huh. Do you follow passenger shaming on Instagram? What? It's a full account called passenger shaming, and it's all flight attendants and pilots and gate agents that talk about, look at this picture. Look at this oh, one. Oh, you may have just changed my life. It's everything. And they they go in. They they always respect, like, they don't show someone's face Space. or anything, yes. or any pertinent, yes. like, yeah. Yeah. but it's always like, look at these feet just up on a table. Oh, yeah. Look yeah. at this. Uh-huh. Yeah. That gross. Disgusting. Um, you can follow me on Instagram, Delta Work on Instagram. Where can people find you? Uh, CocoPeru.com, um, you know, all the social medias. I'm yeah. out there. Yeah. They can find you there. Um, you can also follow the show on Instagram and TikTok at Very Delta to get dedicated socials because if you're not following us there, you're really only getting 50% of the Delta. Uh, join me next week right here for another episode of Very Delta. And until then, keep things very, 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 very Delta. On the next Very Delta, bitch, it's Cody Rigsby. Very Delta is for... Uh Uh-huh. I feel like Very Delta is for the woman who asks for butter when bread is being served with olive oil. You have no idea how succinct that is. This episode of Very Delta was brought to you by Orange Diamond, the official emoji of the Very Delta show. To listen to Very Delta one day early and ad-free, sign up for Mom Plus at mompodcasts.plus. Very Delta is produced by Moguls of Media, a.k.a. Mom. Hosted by Delta Work and produced by Mark Jacobs. Engineered by Margot Padilla and editing by Doug Robertson. Executive produced by Willem Belli, Alaska Thunderfuck, Big Dipper, and Joe Cilio. Hi, it's me, Delta Work. Do you like to see me go off? Well, if you do, hit subscribe, turn on your notifications, because we don't want you to miss any of our mom podcast exclusive content.